I want to carry on this morning from what we started last week. Um, it's always interesting to me to see how God works in situations. And I don't always know what I'm going to come with on Sunday because God starts to work in situations and very often things change and morph and they'll change particularly on Sunday mornings. And so we don't really get to collaborate and talk about what's going on here. And it's interesting when you get to that place and you come in because you begin to see that God's been working in people's lives and you see the theme and the flow that comes through praise and worship and comes through the offering. And then it sets the platform for the message, which is always good. Um, If you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 18. Actually, don't open it if you don't have the passion. I'll read it to you. Or Rafa might. (laughs) This is how Jesus, God's anointed one, was born. His mother Mary had promised Joseph to be his wife, but while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Her fiancé, Joseph, was a righteous man, full of integrity, and he didn't want to disgrace her. But when he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to break the engagement. While he was still debating with himself about what to do, he fell asleep and had a supernatural dream. An angel from the Lord appeared to him in clear light and said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't hesitate to take Mary into your home as your wife, because the power of the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in her womb. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him, for he is destined to give life, to save his people from their sins. What I want to do is I'm just going to set up this morning a little bit and then what we'll do is we'll kind of just, we'll catapult into today um, and get from there. What I want to speak to you about this morning is something that I've titled, Not Preoccupied with All the Answers. Not Preoccupied with All the Answers. There aren't many people who don't find it difficult to relate to the situation that Joseph found himself in, a predicament where circumstances and situations were different to what he imagined that they would be. I didn't think that things would work out this way. I didn't think that things would end up the way that they were. It wasn't like I imagined it was going to be. I went into the situation with anticipation and with keenness. I went into the situation looking forward to what it was going to be because I had everything planned out and I knew what it was going to look like and I knew how it was going to be and I was excited about about the anticipation. I was looking forward to the certainty only to discover that nothing ended up being as I imagined it would be. And suddenly I find myself in a place, in a predicament where I have to sit there and I have to start looking at the situation and I have to make some decisions about how it is that I want to move forward. And I, it's in that place and it's in that, that moment that it becomes so important for us to be able to take a breath, to be able to sit back, to be able to take a moment and to sit and say, I cannot be led by my circumstances. I cannot be controlled by the situation that I find myself in, but I need to be able to find out where is God where I am right now. I need to find a place where I'm able to get a hold of where he is and get his direction for my life. Why? Because I begin to realize that God and the concept that I have of God is so limited When I'm dealing with God, I'm dealing with something called truth. And I recognize the expansiveness of truth. Truth is something that is so much bigger than any frame of reference that I have. Truth and the magnitude of truth is bigger than anything that I can possibly comprehend. And so I find myself in this universe called truth. And I'm at this place where I'm I'm sitting saying, can I give definition to what it is? And the moment that I set my boundaries, the moment that I live in a place called certainty, I establish myself in a place place where I'm not open to the potential and the opportunity that truth wants to invite me into. Truth is always sitting there saying, if you can find me in that place, I will liberate you and I will set you free. Freedom is all about moving outside of my boundaries. It's all about moving outside of those constraints, those those places where I put myself, where I think I have such definition 
about myself. I've got such definition about who God is and what he's all about. And I know with clarity as to what my, cir- my cir- circumstances and what my future is going to look like. And all of a sudden in that space, God says, you've got to discover truth. Because when you find truth in that space, it'll set you free. And it'll use it as an opportunity to project you forward into something that you never imagined. The truth is there to set us free. We don't look for truth as a concept. We don't look for truth as an idea. Truth is not a formula. It's not something that we follow. He introduces us to the reality and he introduces us to the knowledge that truth is a relationship. It's a living, dynamic relationship. It is the living word who wants to spend time with us and walk through life engaged with us. He's the one who wants to walk into the and situations and he wants to be able to have the opportunity to be able to speak into us all the time he's looking for us to hone our spiritual senses so that we're at a place where continually we spend our lives in relationship with the living word with truth being able to have opportunity to influence where I am right at the moment Part of the challenge that we have is, unless I have relationship with the living word, all that I do is I refer to the written word. But the written word doesn't have relevance outside of the context of my life. It's always to introduce me to the living word that's dynamic and alive. And it's in that place, all too often, that we discover that the reason I'm struggling And the reason I find it hard to move forward is because I've had a relationship with my concept of God. I've been intimate with my concept of God. And I'm shocked to discover that my concept of God and God himself are not the same thing. And suddenly I find myself at a place where I'm I'm uncomfortable and I'm unsettled. Why? Because what God's saying is, don't build your security on what you understand. You build your security on me. I want to make myself known to you. And the only way that I can make myself known to you is I'm going to inject some divine doubt into your situation right now. And so I start to wobble and I start to get a little bit insecure and I start to feel uncomfortable about where I am because all of a sudden my concept of God, my certainty of who he is, is starting to shake a little bit. And I come to the realization that I can't sit there with any sense of conviction, knowing with absolute clarity that I'm able to define this God who is so much bigger than who I am. And he's always wanting to introduce me to newness. He's always wanting to take me beyond the confines and the, and the boundaries that I set for myself. And he's wanting to introduce me to something called amazement. God isn't interested in creating a people who are certain. God's goal is not to create a people who are predictable. God is looking at creating a people who are amazed. His invitation is to meet a God who wants to amaze you with who he is. John chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus talking and it says, because, paraphrase version, because the Father loves me so much and because he cares for me so much and he's so interested in who I am, he shows me things to come. And the things that he's going to show me, the things that are to come in your life are going to amaze you. He invites us into amazement. Jesus was at that place where he was about to be incarnated. The word was about to become flesh and was about to dwell among us. And one of the main reasons that Jesus was born into the world in which we find us is because he was going to introduce us to relationship. He was going to create an opportunity with what he was going to do. He wanted to introduce us to amazement. There is a truth and it is very appropriate. But when we're young, and from our earliest days, we're always told that Jesus is the answer to all of our questions. 
And when we start to spend time with him, and the more intimate we become with him, the more we allow him access to our life, the more we begin to discover that actually he's more interested in questioning all of our answers. Why do you believe that? Why are you in that place? Why do you have that limitation? Why do you see yourself the way that you do? He is always starting to question who we are. He is always starting to question our answers. Those things that form and peg the boundaries to our life. The parameters that give us certainty. He comes into that space and he begins to question it. Why? Because he's putting divine doubt into our life. And he's sitting saying, are you absolutely sure that you're prepared to put your tent down in that place? Are you absolutely sure you're prepared to camp there? Or is there something more? Is there something more? You see, when Jesus started walking the earth and he invited his disciples to come and spend time with him, the thing about his disciples was that they were average people. They were just people like you and me. They were fishermen and they were lay people and they did average stuff like average people do. It wasn't because they didn't know about God. They knew about God because they had history. It was because they had the Torah, because they had spent time in temple. They had heard about God and they had a context and they had an idea as to who this God was. They understood that this was the God that they served who was the God of Abraham and they knew what he had done in Abraham's life. They knew that he had done the miraculous because he was able to meet with Abraham and at the age of 90 was able to give him a son they knew about this God who was dedicated and committed to his people and had taken them out of exile in Egypt and had opened the Red Sea and had done the miraculous not only in their liberation but moving them into the wilderness where he guided them with a pillar and with a cloud where he fed them every single day miraculously where he gave them water out of a rock where he provided everything that they need and he sustained them in that they knew about the God of David The one who fought the giant and opened the door to becoming king. They knew about a God who was so much bigger than their concept of who he was. They just didn't know him. They knew who he was, but their concept was limited until Jesus walked in. Because when Jesus walked in, Jesus brought with him amazement. He did the miraculous. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He turned water into wine. He fed 5,000. He did the amazing. And while he was busy doing the amazing, he was interrogating their belief system. Everything that I knew about God and so much of what defined my belief system, everything that I had pegged down at that point as to who God was, he was begin to, beginning to interrogate and making me feel uncomfortable about where I was in terms of my definition of who God was. But what kept me holding was, on was the fact that I was amazed. The reason I never left him, even though he did things on the Sabbath that he shouldn't have done, even though he went and he had and spent time meeting with people who were sinners, even though he went to feasts with sinners and people that were not part of the clergy, even though he questioned certain things and positioned himself as the Messiah. couldn't let go because he was amazing and so I allowed who he was to begin to influence who I am and his disciples began to change you see God is always looking for the opportunity to introduce himself to us and when he introduces truth into our life it's going to unsettle us it's going to knock us off of our certainty a little bit. And when we're in that place, the reason that he does that is because he wants us to fall in love with him. 
You see, the reason that you fall into a reality called falling in love is because in that space, you're off your center. I am not living in a reality that's defined by certainty. But what keeps me in this space is that it's so amazing. I don't know where it's going to lead and I can't give definition to what the future is going to look like, but I stay in that space because I'm filled with amazement. That's what God calls us into. Relationship is important. Relationship is fundamental. Relationship forms the very essence of what falling in love is all about. It's about being able to relate to one another. And when I begin to relate to somebody in that capacity, that person begins to change me and stretch me. And I recognize that I'm in a place of uncertainty because I don't know exactly how this is going to turn out. But I allow them to influence and I live in that space because I'm amazed. When he begins to walk in our lives, when he begins to do certain things in our lives, he's going to move us to a place where we may be uncertain and we may be uncomfortable and we may not be at a place where we're able to give definition and certainty to what it's going to look like when he's finished. But we hold on to that space because we live in the context of relationship and relating to him. And because he amazes us, what I end up doing, I stay with him and I keep following him. Why? Because it brings about change. Growing in Mary is the seed of the Spirit. Growing inside Mary is the Word that's made flesh. And it won't be too much longer before they're going to get to Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, She's going to give birth. When Mary gives birth, she's not going to be different to any other mother. When a mother looks at her child, at her baby, she adores it. But she doesn't adore it because of what it achieved. She doesn't adore it because of what it accomplished. She adores it because it's the fruit of her being. She adores it because it's flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. I adore it because it's the fruit of who I am. And I look at that being and I adore it for who it is. In Genesis chapter 1, God is busy creating and God speaks to the substance from which everything comes and he speaks to the seas and he says, bring forth the fish that will fill the ocean and he speaks to the dry land and he says, bring forth the living creatures and in verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image. He speaks to himself, the substance from which you are made. And in verse 28, when God has finished making man, it says that God brought. It says that God knelt down and he blessed man. When man had his first conscious encounter, It was face to face with God. God blessing and adoring man. The maker adoring his creation. You are not important to God because of what you did or you didn't do. You are not important to God because you did or did not accomplish. Because of all your great rhetoric. That's why what you do becomes inconsequential to the love that God has for you. Because he is like a father. He loves you because you are of his substance. He looks at you and he adores you for who you are. Not because of what you've done. 
It's important for us because it gives us a framework to begin to understand a God who loves us so much because we are of his substance. And because of that, he's committed to you. Because of that, he loves you. Because of that, he's at a place where he is always on your side. Parenting will teach you about unconditional love. (laughs) From the moment that a child is born, its eyes are fixed on its mother. And its mother's eyes are fixed on the child. The child is looking at its mother. And it recognizes likeness. There's something about being the fruit of what produced you. It recognizes and is able to get to that place where it moves and it understands likeness. I can be connected to you. But it doesn't only recognize likeness. It recognizes the fact that I am myself. I am separate. I am distinct. I am like, but I am unique. It becomes important because what they've discovered nowadays is the way that we discover who we are is when we get to a place where we recognize and we connect through likeness. And through likeness, what ends up happening is we recognize something on the other side that sits and says, because I'm like you, I'm going to allow you to have influence in who I am. Because I'm separate from you, I want to be like you. That's why kids model their parents. That's why they walk around and do things and people say, why are you like you are? You look just like your parents. You behave just like your mother. You speak just like your mother. You gesticulate just like your mother. Why? Because there in the likeness, I saw somebody that I wanted to be like, but I wasn't like. So I started to become like them, even though I wasn't always aware of the fact that I was doing that. Let us make man in our likeness and in our image. What he was saying was, when we made man, man was designed to live in relationship with God. Man was was born to live bonded in relationship with God. Because I was born of his substance, I could look at him and I could say, he's in my likeness. I can relate to him. I see him. But he wasn't just in my likeness. He was image as well. What he was saying was this, I am who you are to be. When man walked with God in the garden, when man spent time speaking to God, when when Adam walked around and was with God, what God was saying to him was, you are born of my substance, but I am the image that you are to be. He was defining who he was. He was giving definition to who Adam was. We are to get definition. If you don't know who you are, go and get into relationship with God. That's what relationship is all about. It's about connection. It's about coming to that place of likeness. It's coming to that place of image where I begin to reflect what I see. We become what we behold. We become what we behold. Corinthians chapter 3 verses 17 and 18 says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He's gonna let you go. The problem with it was because we've been at a place where we haven't been like Adam in close relationship with the creator, we've ended up worshiping the creation. And when you end up worshiping the creation as opposed to the creator, we get a skewed perspective of who I am and what I'm all about. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Truth is going to set you free. It's going to interrogate where you are. It's going to interrogate the reality in which you may find yourself. But the intention is to move you into freedom. 
And we, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are to become like him. We can't, that's why worship becomes so important. Worship isn't singing songs on a Sunday. Worship is all about a lifestyle that says, I elevate you in my life and I esteem you as a person of worth and value. I keep my eyes on you because I want to behold you because I know that I become like what I behold. What did Jesus say? In Mark chapter 5, verse 19, he says, I only do the things I see the Father do. What is he saying? I know that I'm born of his substance. I'm in his likeness. And so I'm keeping my eyes focused on his image because I'm looking to who he is because it's giving definition to who I am. I cannot know myself outside of myself. I need somebody else. I need an image that's going to give definition to who I am. So I keep my eyes focused on the Father because he's defining me all the time. And every time I walk into a situation, every time I'm confronted by somebody sick, every time there's a Lazarus lying in a tomb, I sit there and I sit and say, Father, who am I? Who are you? Who are you? From our perspective, it's all about God. But from his perspective, it's all about you. The word became flesh. The destiny of God's incarnation is not an institution. It's not a word. It's not a church. It's not a doctrine. And it's not the Bible. The scripture speaks to a reality much larger than itself. It speaks to a reality and it speaks to a destiny. The word becoming flesh. God is wanting to do something in your life. He is wanting to become the person that lives through who you are. He's looking for us to behold who he is so that we're opening the door to allow him to come in and live through who we are. Jesus changed everything. And what he began to model for us was who we should be. Part of the reason that he lived was because he was saying to us, I want you to see what the Father in you looks like. This is the standard. This is the measure of who we should be and how we should be living. This is what should be defining our Christian experience. But it doesn't. Why? Because we're comfortable in certainty. To be astonished is to encounter something that is such, so much bigger than my frame of reference. It is bigger than my logic and bigger than my understanding. It's bigger than any part of who I am. And I need to recognize that that's why it's called astonishing. When I engage with something which is astonished. But the reason that we embrace certainty is because it offers us security. When my kids were younger, they're kind of at that point right now. But what defines them is wonderment. Creativity. I think about what could be. And I live in that space. But as I begin to grow and as I begin to mature, so I begin to recognize the idea that maybe imagination isn't to define who I am and what my future is all about. And so I start to embrace understanding because understanding affords me the opportunity to form a grid and a framework by, with which I'm able to start to create certainty to my life, security to my life. I realize that there is, that the reality to my life is fluid. 
And the story of my life is defined by something which not only is where I am, but my reality comes from my past to where I, are, where I am and flows into my future. And what it invites me to do is it invites me to learn from it. So what I begin to recognize and realize is that my actions have consequences. And because of that, I can begin to move to a place where I can make adjustments and adaptations to the way that I behave in circumstances. Why? Because it positions me to move into a future that is more secure, one that's more determined, one that is more certain. As we step into that certainty, it certainly does offer us security. The challenge with it is, the more that we embrace security, the less we leave room for amazement. Certainty does deliver on security. But I can be so certain about who I am. And I can be so certain about how I feel. And I can be so certain about what I want. And I can be so certain about who God is that before terribly long I find myself in a certainty prison. And the moment I find myself in a certainty prison is the very moment I become boring. And my life is boring because there's no space for newness. There is no room for amazement. I think the church has got to that place. We're predictable. We're so certain about our doctrines. We're so certain about who God is. We're so certain about who we are. We regurgitate formulas. We come to expected gatherings. We define by a certainty prison. The problem with it is we never come in the expectation of being amazed. We don't live in the anticipation of newness. And I think that's where God is going to change things. God is going to start working in our lives. As we enter the new year, what I want to tell you something is God is not going to leave you where you are. No matter where you find yourself, God is not going to leave the church where he is. The church is going to, God is going to introduce himself to the church. And when he does, it's going to unsettle a few people. He's going to unsettle some churches. It's going to unsettle denominations. It's going to unsettle many people with titles because it's inconsequential to God. He says, I want amazement to come back because that's what defined Jesus. That was the glue that kept people in relationship with him because in that space, because of who he was, I was prepared to let him have influence in our life. The world wants nothing to do with us because we're boring. We're predictable. They know more about who we are and what we're going to tell them before we even say it. And it has to change. And he's beginning to change those things. You see, when we find ourselves in that place, when we find ourselves in the prison of certainty, is the very space where doubt and faith start to work together to create a new, more expansive world for who we are. You see, in the space that we find ourselves, in that prison in which we find ourselves, the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's certainty. The opposite of faith is not doubt, it's certainty. But when we start to begin to doubt my certainty, it opens the door for faith to come in. You see, in that space, 
in that cell of certainty is that place where faith comes in and faith reaches beyond our security to grab hold of possibilities that we haven't considered. When Jesus introduced the Father to us in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, he didn't say, let me introduce you to the Father of certainty. He said, let me introduce you to the Father of possibilities. Amen. Possibilities. He's not coming in to be conformed to our doctrine. He's not coming in to be conformed to our certainty. He's not coming in to be conformed to our paradigm of who he is. And it varies. Some people don't even believe in God. It's their paradigm. It's their certainty. And what's going to shake their certainty is the fact that God is going to show them amazement. It's not our great ideas that are going to change them. It's not having an argument that's going to change them. It's amazement that's going to change them. And it doesn't come from me. It comes from him. We have to get to that place where we recognize the value of the incarnation because it's not me that they want to see. It's him. It's not me and my rhetoric. It's not me and my ideas. It's not me and my arguments. They want to meet the glory. They want to be in contact with amazement. You cannot be amazed and certain at the same time. They're polar opposites. They're mutually exclusive things. If you want to be certain about where you are and you want to live in certainty, you will never be amazed. And unless we as a church, as long as, until we as a body, until we as believers come to the place where we sit and say, it is more important for me to be amazed than to be certain, God is waiting for the invitation for, it to, for us to invite him in to do something. When Jesus arrived, Jesus didn't arrive and affirm their beliefs. When Jesus walked around and he introduced him as the Messiah, he didn't walk into the temple and say, everything that you have is down pat, like where you are, buddy. <laughs> good belief system, keep up the good work. What did he say? He shook and he un scrambled stuff. Why? Because he started to introduce to us ideas about God that were shocking in some ways. And the problem with it was, it was the religious people who had the hardest time getting outside of their certainty to embrace who he was. We wonder why he spent so much time with the world. Because the world was not as rigid. The world was not as encamped in their prison of certainty as the church was. It was the religious people who said, unless you come into jail with me, I want nothing to do with you. They weren't interested in being amazed. They were interested in putting him to death. He's there to amaze us. And when Jesus walked the earth, the reason that he did the miraculous, the reason that he did all that he did was he wanted to show us an idea and a concept of who the Father was that would change our certainty and introduce us to a new way of living, introduce us to relationship with him. Because in that context, what he was doing was he was saying, I want you to look at me because when you see me, you see the Father. And when you see the Father and you behold the Father, you will become like him. God's intention is never that we live from our place of certainty and he will do whatever is necessary to disrupt that space so that we can be introduced to who he is. Saul is on the road and he's so caught up in his security paradigm. He's so caught up in his certainty that these Christians are so wrong and these Christians need to be punished and these Christians need to be put to death. And all of a sudden, what ends up happening, he meets Jesus in that space and he falls down and immediately in that moment, he says, Lord, Lord, who are you? What happened? He began to doubt everything that he believed up until that point. 
Everything that he believed about God up until that point was in doubt, was in jeopardy. And the moment that he said, Lord, Lord, who are you? What was he saying? He was allowing his doubt to give birth to faith. He was saying, every paradigm and every thought that I had about who you were, I'm letting go of. Now I need for you to, decide, to, to give me an idea as to who you are. I need for you to reveal to me who you are because I've been wrong. My paradigm has been established, but it's been so caught up in a jail that was wrong and inhibiting. It prevented me from walking into the fullness of who you are. God is going to walk into our lives and he's going to shake it a little bit. Hold on. It's okay. It doesn't unstable him. He's there and he'll see you through it. It's important to understand this. We think that the church has to have all the answers. But actually, that's not the way that the church was established. If you go to Acts chapter 2 and you read about it, what ended up happening was the early church was characterized by a whole group of people who had more questions than answers. What happened? They were in the upper room and they were praying and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost, I don't know what that is, (laughs) came upon me and there were people and they had fire on their heads and they started speaking with other tongues. And they ran out into the streets. And what did they do? They didn't run out and say, hey, world, we've got all the answers. They ran out and said, we've got more questions than answers because we've just had an encounter. We've just been overwhelmed. We've just been in awe. We've just been amazed because people had fire on their heads and this thing called the Holy Spirit arrived and tongues started breaking out and we don't really know what it is and we're trying to find out how it fits our doctrine and where we stand and what things are all about. Anytime we're grounded and rooted in the fact that we have all the answers, We've just established a prison for ourselves. It's okay camping in a place where you have more questions than answers. It's a good place to be because when you camped out in questions and not answers, it says, I am open and I'm humble. When I'm camped out in questions and not answers, what it says is, I'm open to you coming in and giving definition to who you are, changing my concept of who you are, introducing me to faith, a new dimension and an understanding of truth that I've never walked into before. We're going to wonderful places. If there's one thing you can be sure of when you get onto a roller coaster, there's no certainty. When you think you should be going down, you suddenly find yourself going up. And when you're going up, all of a sudden you didn't anticipate it, but you're not only going down, but you're also bending sideways. And then you didn't realize that as you went around the next turn, there was a big water dive that came with it. You can't live in that certainty. Don't live in a space where we think that we have God defined. Don't live in a space where we think I can give definition to who I am. When we recognize who he is and we recognize the magnitude and the expansiveness of truth, always live in a space where I'm open to him giving definition to who he is. Because as he gives definition to he, who he is, he's going to redefine who you are. We become like what we behold. And when we see something new of him, I'm going to discover something new about who I am. Father, I just want to thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Jesus. The word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. I thank you for what you modeled. I thank you for amazing us. I thank you for liberating us from a prison where we have all the answers and introducing us to the paradigm that we can be comfortable living in questions. I pray for every person that's represented here. I pray for every person who's watching. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you will begin to work in their lives 
and continue to work in their lives in a profound way. I ask you to introduce them to amazement. I ask you to amaze them with who you are. For people who are in prisons of certainty, I thank you, Father, in worshiping you. The chains are broken, and we can walk into freedom. A liberated and a larger existence of anything that we've possibly known. I thank you for what you're doing at Living Faith. I thank you, Father, for the year that lies ahead. I thank you that it's a year that's going to be characterized and defined by amazement and wonder. Holy Spirit, we dedicate this year to you, and we commit this year to you. We invite you in here to change and to rattle, to unsettle certainty and predictability, to put us at a place where people come in not because they think that we're so great, but because they want to be amazed. We bless you for it. We thank you for all of your goodness. Amen.